wanted to come. Good. <laughs> I really wanted to come in person. Uh, other things came in between. But nevertheless, um, today I'm going to talk about patterns of speciation across macro and the microevolutionary scales in Arabia butterflies. Oops. So my presentation has two parts. The first is uh, on the macroevolution impact of varying chromosome numbers on the rates of speciation. And then the second part looks then in the sec uh, secondary contact zones in Arabia butterflies, but also a bit beyond. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge uh, acknowledge that uh, just not it's it's not just my research it's actually the research uh, done by the people in my group um the past and the current um you will see their results uh, presented by me <laughs> um so currently i have two phd students that's hana and kami that just uh, kami just started uh, her phd last week and hana is uh, in in her last year um i also have a master student uh, uh, at, still at the University of Basel, I just moved to the University of Neuchâtel, um, started secondary contact zones uh, in the Alps, and uh, this, uh, actually for, for the second part of my presentation, that's based on a master's uh, study uh, with Selim, uh, who is now a PhD student, actually completely switched topics working on tuberculosis. But first things first, so what has brought me here? In the end, so it's really my interest in, to uh, try to understand how species evolve, how biodiversity evolves and is maintained, and of course, what is there nicer to show biodiversity than this beautiful picture of pinned dead animals, right? And of course, it's a long-standing debate, like how species evolve. But already Darwin outlined that the origin of species is a mis is the mystery of mysteries, and despite the many flavors that have been developed since then, so like a genetic point of view of how species work, uh, how speciation work in plants, in, a, in, in animals, more ecological sites. We still don't know much about how speciation actually could work, especially at an advanced stage. And these different types of <clears throat> theories often disagree with each other, but there's one unifying thing. I, uh, I think, and that's for speciation, we basically need um, barriers to gene flow. And there's different types of barriers. And for the macroevolutionary part, um, um, actually, uh, we'll talk about um, <clears throat> a classic type of barrier, which are changes in chromosome numbers. So so-called chromosomal speciation is re uh, old uh, uh, speciation type theory. Uh, as you can see here, just highlighting some of the classic books, they are going back to the 70s. Uh, and the idea there is that rearranged chromosomes or novel carrier types would, uh, uh, would lead to hybrid sterility. So if you have two lineages of species that mate with each other, different chromosome numbers, they will produce sterile offspring. As a consequence, differentially fixed rearrangements would quickly result in strong reproductive isolation. However, fixation is often thought to, uh, to be unlikely because, of, uh, of course, if you have a rearrangement and you start mating with someone uh, who has another rearrangement, then the offspring is less fit. So how does how does would this get fixation? More recent takes on chromosomal speciation have uh, suggested that rearranged sections of the genome could actually enhance reproductive isolation by reducing recombination. So basically, part of the genome that's rearranged uh, is then shielded through recombination, so that would uh, uh, advance the buildup of, uh, of uh, uh, genomic barriers uh, in that part, and then spread throughout the genome. Under this uh, case, under this scenario, re rearranged chromosomes could become fixed, either by drift or through selection, for example, when two or more adaptive flaws have become physically coupled. So imagine you have like two chromosomes uh, fusing together each on each end, you have a uh, low side that's, that's adaptive, so selection would be stronger and leads <clears throat> to, uh, to the fixation uh, of, of this new carrier type. However, chromosomal speciation is still deemed to be unlikely. And what we suggest is that people just thought about it from uh, with monocentric chromosomes in mind. So monocentric chromosomes are the chromosomes that we have. So basically during cell division, you have central uh, emeric region that uh, uh, where the microtubuli bind. Um, and as a consequence, 
if you have a rearrangement, so for example, you have a fission event, so where part of the chromosome gets cut off, uh, the part that, that is not attached anymore to a centromere is likely to be lost during cell division. As a consequence, this outcome here should have low fitness. But of course, not all species have centromeres. Some species have lost their centromeres and became so-called holocentric. So many holocentric um, species that have instead so-called centromere-like structures throughout the chromosome. As a consequence, um, if you have a rearrangement, you, the, those rearranged sections are actually not lost during cell division. So the outcome of, of a rearrangement is, uh, should be uh, have a similar fitness than the original one. And to give you some examples of, of what, what can happen in the, those holocentric groups, um, as shown here, so these are two closely related butterflies, and the idea is that they, uh, they, they can actually undergo chromosome rearrangement more easily because it's, uh, there should be less fitness constraints. And that seems to be the case in, in, this, uh, in this system, where you have like one species with more than 200 chromosomes and the other has a, um, a magnitude less chromosomes. Genome size is, 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 however, very similar. So this is all through chromosomal fusion and fission. So the, uh, fusing together two chromosomes into one and splitting a chromosome into two. And this doesn't just happen in butterflies or Lepidoptera. This also exists in plants, for example, here uh, in Cetus or Carex, uh, where we have similar uh, variation in chromosome numbers. And what we did uh, is in this uh, opinion paper that we published this year, we tried to link uh, the phylogenetic uh, models of trait evolution that are linked with uh, chromosomal evolution with the, uh, the classic um, chromosomal speciation theory. So for example, for phylogenetic models, so you would have here this is a phylogeny, you could have so-called cladogenesis, uh, which means that the carrier type evolution happens at speciation events. So basically here you have a change in, in uh, chromosomes and this uh, leads to a rapid split uh, along the phylogeny. You could also have anagenesis where carrier type evolution evolves along a branch. So for example, here, this is a anagenetic chromosomal change. So uh, you would have within a population like the uh, higher standing genetic variation of, 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 of carrier types that eventually leads to the split of a species. Of course, those things are non-exclusive and we can uh, think about the interaction of, of both ANA and cladogenesis. And we can link this now to the, uh, to the classic uh, chromosomal speciation theory in the sense that this cladogenesis resembles the idea of the so-called hybrid dysfunction models where you have rapid speciation and anagenesis would be more consistent with this suppression of recombination type models. Okay, so much about the theory. Um, let's have a look at the data. And uh, this was actually, um, uh, a project we did uh, some years ago, so with me and uh, Yuri and our two PhD students, Hannah and Livio. And what we did is we went to the literature, we identified uh, almost 2,400 uh, Lepidoptera taxa, for which we have chromosome counts. And what you can see, this is the distribution, like most species actually have about 30, 31 chromosomes. However, this is not equally distributed across the genera. So some genera really are crazy when it comes to chromosome numbers, so like polyomatous. So this is the uh, example that I showed you before with the more than 200 chromosome, that's the one up here. Other groups uh, are also very diverse in, cr in chromosome numbers, like Arabia, it's the one that we study uh, mostly, but then other groups are really boring, like morpho, at least when it comes to chromosome numbers. <clears throat> And we, uh, we took those uh, <clears throat> species, we, we, we tried to get as much genetic data for, from the public repositories that we could get and established uh, phylogenies. And then we run um, the, uh, this software called Chromo SSC, which estimates cladogenetic and anagenetic impact on chromosome number evolution along those phylogenies. And it allows us to estimate different parameters. And I will just uh, show you some. So what I will do is I will always show you this example for Tagades, just because it also does exactly what I would like to have show, uh, you, uh, to show you. And then we zoom out on the, uh, to the different genera. So here in Tagades, we see, first of all, that the rate of chromosomal evolution 
is higher uh, has a, a higher anagenetic uh, component than a cladogenetic component. Zooming out on the different uh, on the different uh, groups that we studied, so we see here that anagenesis is more important in uh, in the groups that are highlighted in green versus uh, the other groups uh, in blue that are very cladogenetic uh, changes are more important. So overall, the, imp uh, the importance of anagenesis and cladogenesis seems to be genus specific. Because I also have a look what the proportion of changes uh, that lead to speciation are, are associated with fusion or fission events, so the splitting up or fusing together of, of chromosomes. Uh, this is actually significant here, so that fusion seemed to be more important in type 80s. Zooming out in red, you would have cases where we have fu uh, fusions to be more important <clears throat> than fissions highlighted in blue, and often there's no difference. So again, this seems the importance of fusion fission seems to be something genus specific. Of course, the question was like, does it have an impact on rates of speciation? So we can actually see it like the rate of speciation that's associated with chromosomes or without. And here clearly, there's a higher there's a higher rate of speciation when changes in chromosome numbers occur. Zooming out, this was actually the case for almost all genera, except the ones where we have very little um, uh, variation in, in the chromosome numbers. <coughs> so overall, speciation rates seem to be <coughs> generally higher with, when chromosomal uh, changes are involved. And we can do that. Uh, we can. Uh, plot this differently. So here again, it's the rate of chromosomal evolution across all the genera against the diversification rate, so the speciation rate, and we see that genera with more variable chromosomes actually diversify faster. So the conclusion so far is that varying chromosome numbers seem to have an impact on rates of speciation, but that the underlying mechanisms such as fusion versus fission or anagenetic versus cladogenetic seem to uh, differ among genera. So far, so good. So the next question we had was like, what does it look like within a, a genus? And for this, um, this is now the PhD project of, uh, of Hannah. We focused on the Arabia butterflies. So Arabia, um, there's more than 100 described species across the northern hemisphere. Uh, in Switzerland, for example, uh, it, it, it's a hotspot with 27 species, probably soon 29, depending on how we can split them further. Um, and this is just uh, an overview of most of the species that we have in Switzerland with the ideal uh, habitat along an elevational gradient. So the species are often called adapted and they've diversified in Europe over the last 15 million years. So Europe is a, a diversity hotspot for Arabia. And of course, there are different chromosome numbers. So shown here are the different uh, subgroups uh, of Arabia uh, that have been described with, uh, chromosome num uh, with, uh, with chromosome numbers that we had for different species. And you can already see here this group of Tindaris, you will hear more about them. Um, it's really diverse when others are, uh, uh, show very little variation. So for HANA, we, we were able to, uh, to get um, 82 Arabia species, which we uh, we did whole genome resequencing. We had uh, five outgroup species, and we ended up with about 2,900 single copy orthologs genes. <clears throat> what we did is we did generated individual trees and combined them with Astral to run in the end Chromo SSC. And what we got is this. So behold, this is to my knowledge the first almost fully resolved phylogeny and a, a data phylogeny of Arabia, so we could actually um, uh, resolve most of the groups that have been described before, so that, that worked pre pretty well, with a few surprises as, as well. Um, yes. And running Chroma as a C on the entire tree, <clears throat> Uh, we, uh, we get this result. I just want to highlight uh, two of them. Basically, that most of the speciation events involve chromosomal rearrangements. So basically, here's the rate of speciation without chromosomal change, and you can see all the other. So if you have uh, cladogenesis uh, with fission fusion or anagenesis with fission fusion, these are always higher than without chromosomal change. Also interesting is that fusions 
are more often anagenetic. So we have here the uh, anagenetic chromosome fusion. When for fission, this is uh, this is a uh, more cladogen. Uh, this results more in cladogenic changes. So that's that's again uh, uh, across the entire genus. What about within within Arabia? If, uh, across the different groups uh, that there are. And that's what Hannah did. Um, so <clears throat> we split up the phylogeny into six groups for which we had most carological information. Uh, we run again chroma SSC separately for each of them. Uh, so we have uh, the, uh, the rates, uh, the speci uh, spe speciation uh, rates, oh, sorry, <laughs> for anagenetic and cladogenetic impacts, and then for fusion and fission. Um, and I just want to highlight here. Uh, the, the, this purple group, so that's the Tindarus group, the youngest and most diverse, carological diverse group uh, that there is, and we can see there's um, much hi uh, much higher uh, uh, rates of speci uh, speciation going on. Also, taking the total speciation is much higher within, for example, Tindarus than groups that uh, that have very little chromosomal rearrangements. <clears throat> So overall, we find differences in ana and cladogenetic changes within a genus. And uh, what we think we see is that we have chromosomal changes that are associated with bursts of diversification. So the next question that we have is like, what actually underlies those chromosomal fusion fission sites? How does this actually work? How is this controlled? Why do only some groups do that, not the others? And this is the PhD project of Kami. Uh, she just started last week. She starts to get her hands dirty on DNA extractions, but stay tuned. I will probably be able to tell you more about this in a few years. That was part one. So let's go for the uh, for second part about secondary contact zones. For this, I will take you to Switzerland. So you're currently somewhere around here. Switzerland is here. Uh, I'm sitting in my office here. This is Switzerland as it looks today. This is an elevation map. But of course, Switzerland looked quite different <clears throat> about 20,000 years ago because most of the country was glaciated. As a consequence, most of the extant biodiversity we have didn't exist here. Instead, species survived in different glacial future and have recolonized the country, often from one or multiple uh, 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 refuge uh, since the uh, deglaciation period. This is a common thing. Uh, I just uh, took this figure from the seminal paper from Uvit uh, that, uh, that actually highlights uh, how, um, following the, uh, the glacial retreats, that many species recolonized Europe from different glacial refugias, uh, from uh, crickets over butterflies to bears. And of course, the question is what happens if those lineages? Uh, come together because often in different glacial refugias they diverged through time, they accumulated different incompatibilities. So it's actually like allopatric speciation event. But if they didn't uh, acquire enough reproductive uh, barriers, what happens then? So again, uh, think about uh, think about. Uh, uh, this po original population of species that get subdivided, for example, through a glacier, there's different potential outcomes. So if those lineages did, uh, don't, uh, didn't really acquire strong reproductive isolations, in theory, they could fuse together, they could hybridize, <coughs> collapse uh, into one species again. Uh, you could also think about a scenario where you have a hybrid zone and the hybrids actually outperformed the uh, the parental species, and this could actually lead to so-called hybrid speciation, where additional reproductive barriers evolve, <clears throat> uh, leading to free species in the end. And there's also some uh, cool examples uh, uh, in the Alps for butterflies. Um, and then often you have this like uh, contact zones or hybrid zones, so you have uh, hybrids, but if, you, if the hybrids are selected against, then additional barriers will need to uh, evolve or existing ones need to be reinforced so that in the end, this could actually lead or promote speciation so, or lead to the completion of speciation so that you could have two good species that don't, don't <coughs> interbreed anymore or could eventually even coexist. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> 
Such hybrid zones are often started uh, using Klein analysis. So imagine you have like uh, two species, like one in green, one in blue species, and a trait, or it can also be an uh, allele. <clears throat> and you go from one species to the other. And then here, the, the width of the Klein really depends on the strength of selection. So if you have strong selection, the, the, the Klein actually gets narrower and narrower. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, let's go back to Arabia. So this is our PET system, the one that Hannah also looks at in greater detail <coughs> for her PhD, where we have three closely related species. We have Tindarus, which is sandwiched by Casuidus, uh, and Nival is actually existing here in the Eastern Alps and in Austria. But there's this one spot here where all the three species uh, exist. And what we know for the free, uh, from the three species is that they differ in, in carrier types in the sense that Nivalis has a chromosome more than the others. From classic crossing, ex crossing experiments from the 1960s, we know that we could cross these and get fertile F1s. We could also cross these and get few F1s that are probably sterile, and we don't know what happens when we cross these. Um, Nevertheless, in the field, people report often intermediate phenotypes based on phenotypic um, analysis. Today, I will focus primarily on the <clears throat> on these two species uh, because it uh, became the main focus of Hannah's PhD. Nevertheless, you will see Nivali sometime popping up. So with Hannah, what we did is we collected in Switzerland two contact zones uh, of the uh, Tindarus and Casuidus, as well as allopatric uh, populations of uh, Tindarus, uh, as well as uh, Casuidus. And we uh, got uh, genomic data, so we had 350 resequenced genomes, <coughs> generated reference genome assembly for uh, Casuidus, and we ended up with something like 5 million SNPs. And then we just do a, a principal components analysis, we see, first of all, PC1 explains 80% of, uh, of the total variation, which is massive, given that we have like 5 million SNPs, separating the two species, we have Casuidus and Tundaros. And we actually found only two F1 hybrids. Uh, we also see there's more genetic variation within Tundaros because uh, we, uh, we see quite some population structure within here. Running a uh, mixture, so it's basically a software that, uh, that does individual based assignments. So we have an, uh, each bar here is an individual, uh, and then based on the color, you can estimate uh, what is the genomic contribution of one or the other species. So here it's 100% purple, so it's 100% casuitis. This one is 100% green, it's 100% Tindarus. And here are the two F1 hybrids that are 50 50. So we see there's very strong interspe interspecific differentiation with a few F1 hybrids, which is not what we initially predicted. <laughs> Looking at the contact zones, um, so um, here you, you can see here's uh, the zone where they actually overlap, including the F1 hybrids also here. So they spatially overlap. So we, we, we literally uh, found uh, collected them next to each other. Uh, and I will actually zoom in on this contact zone for a bit because the other one we just added more recently <clears throat> and uh, uh, is, is now a uh, part of, of a further investigation. Uh, this is the actual point of contact. So you can see here in, in orange, it's Casuidus, in blue, it's, uh, it's Tundaros, and uh, really the, they fly together. Uh, the hybrids uh, were collected as, as, at the same day as uh, Tindarus and Casuidus, and that's what hybrid looks like. So for, on a wing morphology uh, wise, they, they look like intermediates often. Uh, male genitalia here, so, I mean, sample size is very limited, but you can, you, you can see that individual here doesn't look very normal. That one looks a bit more normal when, uh, in terms of male genitalia. So, Across this, uh, so, so uh, taking the genomic data for this uh, contact zone, we can then fit Klein. Uh, uh, and what we actually see is like we find this uh, this nice Klein, which is super narrow, uh, suggesting that there's likely to be strong selection against hybrids. That also, would also explain why we find only F1 hybrids. So the question is, what keeps the two species actually apart? 
And when you think about spe uh, two species, right? So there could be pre uh, pre mating, pre zygotic isolation, there could be post mating, pre zygotic isolation, and post zygotic isolation. Given that we have <clears throat> only F1 hybrids, we could guess there could be some genetic incompatibilities which we uh, cannot study at the moment. We probably will dig a bit deeper uh, into that in the, uh, in the future. Um, so what else can, uh, can we uh, can we think of? So for example, the two species could use different habitats. So the habitat isolation, they could be temporarily isolated, so they fly different days of the year. They could be behavioral isolated, mate choice uh, related uh, isolation. But of course, there could be also some gametic isolation. So even though they would fertilize, uh, so even though they would mate, the eggs would not be fertilized, as an example. Uh, what we look at so far is, for example, the ecological niche. So what we did is, for each individual in the field, we collected the GPS coordinate, and then we went to, uh, to public repositories and extracted ecological data. And uh, <clears throat> we also, uh, we again fitted clients. And this is the result. So we got ecological data uh, linked to temperature, precipitation, um, seasonality and so on and so forth. So we picked the seven least correlated uh, variables here and fit the clients. And what we see is we actually uh, find a client. However, it doesn't overlap with the genetic client, which is here the dashed line, uh, but it happens within the distribution of Arabia casserita. So it's, it doesn't differ between species. We also got geological data, so we tried to, uh, to see if there's like a difference in substrate, because often butterflies use different substrate types. <clears throat> and indeed, for allopatric casuidas and tundaris, we see that outside of the contact zone, casuidas seems to occur primarily on limestone, when tundaris occurs primarily in gneiss. But of course, at a contact zone, they occur in the same substrate. So we find some ecological differentiation within casuidas, but it doesn't overlap with the genetic side client. So it's likely not a strong barrier, preventing, uh, <clears throat> uh, in, 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 sorry, inducing selection against hybrids. What about temporal isolation? So just looking at the days when, uh, when we collected them, so we can see that Tindar at the contact zones, Tindar flies a bit earlier, than uh, casuidas, but still they overlap quite a bit. And there's no difference between the allopatric sites and the contact zones. So there is temporal overlap, so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem to be a strong barrier. For behavioral isolation, we looked at, the, uh, at morphology. Uh, for this, Hannah phenotyped a few hundred individuals for both wing shape and male gen uh, genital morphology. And then what we did is uh, we did a, a principal components analysis and then again tried to fit a client across the secondary contact zone. And this is the result. So we can fit a client that actually overlaps between the, both male genitalia and um, wing shape. And the clients are relatively narrow. Actually, male genital is, is, is extremely narrow on the overlap of the genetic uh, client. So given the overlap with the genetic client, this could potentially be, uh, be uh, in, at least indirectly linked. So this could be mate choice involved. <clears throat> we don't know more about this for the moment. So Kami is also looking now into the pheromones of, uh, of these butterflies, so perhaps we Find if, uh, so, 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 sorry, perhaps we'll find, uh, I can present you with some more information soon. So, what could keep the two species apart? There's actually something that we didn't expect. And that's when we extracted the DNA of the butterflies. Of course, we didn't just extract the DNA of the butterflies, but also the parasites, which is Olbachia. Uh, so this is an insect cell, a cell with different Wolbachia cells in it. And uh, Wolbachia is a common bacterial endoparasite, and it can result in <clears throat> cytoplasmatic incompatibilities, male killing, feminization, and so on. At least in other systems, we actually have no clue what they do in Arabia yet. Nevertheless, they could act as a barrier to gene growth. So why I'm talking about Wolbachia? Well, uh, apologies. So this is uh, still a work in progress. Uh, so shown here is actually um, <clears throat> a figure from an old, from an old publication with a subset of, of, the, of the individuals that the uh, HANA has genotyped. 
So this is again the same contact zone. We have here in green Cassiridis, in blue Tyndarus, and in orange uh, Nivalis. Here is the contact zone. Here's our F, here are the F1 hybrids. And <clears throat> these are the genotyped individuals. And in the next slide, I will show you the ones that have Wolbachia. Boom. So as you can see, Tyndarus does not have Wolbachia. Two F1 hybrids have Wolbachia. Even more, we didn't just have one Wolbachia lineage, we have two. Zooming out on the distribution, uh, on the data that we had, we can actually show that this Wolbachia lineage here is also found in, in the uh, Massif Central and the Pyrenees. So it's likely from a Caceridas population that survived in, a, in Refugia in southern France and has recolonized the Alps from the west to the east. When here, these Caceridas here, as well as uh, Nivalis in Austria and also some uh, Tindaris in the eastern range, they have the same Wolbachia strain. So probably from different glacial Refugia and they have recolonized the Alps from the east to the west. Of course, we can take the prevalence of Wolbachia and fit a client through it, and there's a perfect overlap with the genetic line. So you have the version of Wolbachia infections, and this could potentially be a barrier to gene flow. This is as far as we got. The pattern uh, holds up with both uh, contact zones. I just uh, we didn't plot that yet. So much about Tundarus. Uh, the cool thing about Arabia is that there are several contact zones in different uh, species complexes, and that would allow us, hopefully, to understand if, the, if there are some generalities or not. At least that was my hope. Uh, for this, we could have used a, a different uh, study system, which is um, Arabia Oriala. So again, this is a master thesis. It started as a master thesis in 2018. And to introduce the <clears throat> Oriala system, so we have two subspecies, Isarica and Adita, that differ primarily in the field in the presence and absence of this white dot here, which is, of course, not always there. They also differ in male genitalia. Um, across the Alps, there are different subspecies. Uh, the, the, there's some studies by Cupedo that, that, that highlights these. Um, uh, but Again, uh, we're primarily concerned by Isorica, which is more eastern um, um, uh, subspecies, and Aditis is, uh, occurs more in the southwestern Alps. And why they were interesting is because someone else actually went out uh, and published this uh, uh, paper about contact zones in, uh, in Switzerland. So what he did is he went out and uh, he, he actually found this contact zone coming where you go from like one species Zarica to the other one uh, Adita with intermediate phenotypes. At least that's how he described it. So, uh, and it's like two contact zones, what we call now the Western and the Eastern contact zone. So in Switzerland, oops, we're currently here, zooming in, these are the contact zones, the Western contact zone, the Eastern contact zone. And for each contact zone, we also sampled some allopatric sites for Zarica and Adita. And you can see here uh, the Western contacts are especially more uh, connected than the Eastern one. They really have valleys in between, so there's there's, there's less uh, likely less gene flow. That's what it looks like in the field. Uh, so imagine you stand here uh, where the blue square is, and, uh, and you uh, uh, watch on the other side. So here's the contact zone. These are the allopatric isoric and Adita. The other contact zone is here, so you can see there are like very steep mountain slopes, so that's always very, a lot of fun in the field. And what we did is, again, from, uh, starting with morphology, so this is male genitalia, principal components one. Uh, these are the allopatric populations, and you see they differ, but there's also quite some overlap between the two subspecies. But when we went into the contact zone, what we found in 2018, Basically, most individuals looked like allopatric isorica, which was very puzzling for us. Then we went back in 2019, uh, 2019 and actually found that a phenotypic shift to individuals that look more like allopatric aditia. In 2020, again, isorica, 21, aditia like phenotypes. And this year, I, we, did, we didn't phenotype them yet, but I can already tell it's again isorica like phenotypes. So we have the significant shift 
in, uh, in phenotypes in the eastern contact zone, less so for the western contact zone. I will uh, show you later why this is likely the case. Uh, for male genitalia, it actually also occurs for wing, uh, wing shape. So we have really this, uh, the, a shift that we have primarily isorica like phenotypes in even years and adipti phenotypes in odd years. But what about the contacts on our initially described, right? This is the picture basically from the publication. So we went back to the Natural History Museum where the person deposited uh, his samples. We removed some misidentified species and found this. We realized that he didn't collect in one year, he collected over multiple years. He just never separated them by year. Doing so, we found the same phenotypic shifts between even uh, between even and odd years to more, for, from a more isorica to more uh, adipton like phenotype, actually at both uh, both contact zones. So let's have a look at the genetics. So again, this is a, this is now a small subset, um, uh, a genomic subset with I think about a thousand SNPs. Um, but as, as the same idea, so we do, uh, do a mixture analysis. So each bar is basically an, an individual. So this is a pure uh, Isarica genotype. This is a pure orange, pure, uh, so pure Adita genotype. And what we can see is already at the uh, allopatric sites in the Western contact zone, we have an F1 hybrid. Uh, when here there's very little uh, gene flow between the two, uh, between Isarica and Adita. At the contact zones in 2018, Genetically, we actually caught primarily Isarica. In 2019, at the West Eastern contact zone, where we actually see the significant phenotypic shifts, we, um, we have primarily Adita uh, genotypes with, with this one F1 hybrid. When in the other uh, Western contact zone, that is spatially more connected, uh, we have uh, a, a, we, see, we actually find both Adita and Isarica with F1 hybrids. And of course, in 2020. Again, primarily is Arica. This is as far as we genotype. I will soon have a PhD student starting on this project where we actually go for whole genome sequence data. Uh, looking now at, a, at an individual based uh, SNP table, so we have now individuals are like in the horizontal line. These are the sites that are basically fixed between is Arica and the DITA, just to have a look what happens in terms of introgression across the genome. So we see for the Eastern contact zone, there's, there's some integration shown here as the heterozygocytes, oops, uh, uh, heterozygocytes uh, across the genome. Uh, uh, it looks like there's more integration from Isarica into Adita than the other way around. And the Western contact zone, the one that's spatially more connected, the, we, we actually see also there's more integration going on. So overall, what it suggests is like a spatial isolation seems to result in reduced interspecific gene flow. So the eastern contact zone that separated by valleys, we see very little introgression. And the, or the, other, uh, the western contact zone, which is connected, we see probably more a gene flow. Potentially, there's maladaptive gene flow from allopatric side. So basically, an uh, individual comes in from the allopatric side and starts to mate with the other uh, subspecies. Given that we have this phenotypic overlap between Isarica and the Ditta, as well as the intermediates, uh, it doesn't seem to be a strong barrier in our case. What about Wolbachia? Here, um, we find that at the contact zone, both uh, lineages have uh, subspecies have the same Wolbachia strain, uh, and the prevalence is actually really low in, in, in comparison to most of the other Arabia species that we looked at so far. So Wolbachia doesn't seem to be uh, a strong barrier. Um, given the, uh, the difference in prevalence uh, of Isarica uh, and Adita, so that one occur, uh, occurs primarily in even the other in odd years, what we think is, is that we uh, have a case of so-called allochony, so temporal isolation between the lineages that could maintain the secondary contact zone, which is something that has been suggest is suggested. So allochronic speciation is uh, also a classic concept, but there are not that many examples. Why uh, uh, allochrony? So what? 
So what, uh, what I did is I got from the Swiss distribution uh, database, I got uh, observational data for about 16,000 uh, Arabia or Riala individuals, and I just plotted with, without knowing what subspecies they are. I plotted them on a five by five uh, kilometer square if species, uh, if individuals would fly primarily in even or in odd years. So cases where it's in even years, oops, sorry, uh, are high, uh, are red, and in uneven years in blue. So this corresponds pretty well with the, uh, with the different subspecies uh, that we have. So this would be primarily Adita flying in even years and uh, Isarica flying in odd years, with of course uh, some uh, some uh, they don't do that everywhere with some shifts. Um, so we tried the next PhD student will try to understand what, uh, genomically what underlies those uh, this, um, uh, this differences in phenology. Surprisingly, also this data, uh, this, uh, the, the, this result uh, suggests that we have a third lineage that differs in phenology because here in the Jura Mountains, this lineage was supposed to be the same as the ones here in blue, but recent phylogenetic uh, analysis suggests that these actually are more related to individuals from the Pyrenees than uh, the ones from the Alps. So we probably have a third lineage uh, of a Rivia Oriala in Switzerland. So to conclude here, zones of secondary contact are common, are very narrow. That's actually very surprising, given that something that can fly. Um, and therefore allow us to study the late stages of speciation. So we're actually, things are really already uh, strongly differentiated, but not really completely. So they cannot really coexist at the moment. Interestingly, so far, the processes seem to differ between species complexes, including, for example, Wache and the Jidaros complex and uh, Alochrony uh, in Oriala. And now what we try to do is to expand this even a bit further on different systems and this is, I just want to quickly highlight uh, the master thesis of, uh, of Elias, uh, who is looking into two uh, subspecies, like Sena, Hippotua, Oridan, and Oridikia. One is uh, high elevation, the other low elevation species, and they also form secondary contact zones. And uh, this is what we sampled uh, this spring, summer. Uh, so we got more than uh, 300 individuals across this contact zone. And he already started to look at the phenotypic uh, data using a machine learning algorithm. For, uh, and what you can see is like across this ele uh, elevational gradient, we, we see a significant uh, phenotypic change consistent with the two uh, subspecies for both males and females. And now we, uh, he just finished DNA extra uh, extractions and we're gonna get some whole genome sequence data on this too. So let's see what's going on there. And with that, uh, I would like to thank um, all the many people that actually helped us um, to get that far. Of course, uh, the funders that tended uh, became more generous over the years, and of course, you for your attention. Perfect. Thank you very much. It was really awesome. I have to say that I got really interested in Arabias. <laughs> Uh, they do really cool things in Alps. Uh, I was first wondering whether there are some questions from the audience. I won't buy it. <laughs> Definitely not. Okay. Uh, I will give uh, the, in that case, no one is, everyone is shy. Uh, <laughs> I just, uh, so the machine learning, which you mentioned at the very last moment, so you are just taking the pictures, pictures of the, of the butterflies and then identifying the morphology by uh, software? Um, yes, sorry, I cannot. Da, 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 da. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, I was. Uh, yes, so th th it's, it's our package patternized, and then you just have to, uh, so, uh, you have to give some thresholds on, on the uh, on the color thresholds that he has the program has to analyze mm -hmm. um and elias had to play a bit around but it uh, it actually ended up so that, uh, picking up differences are really there 
the main the main thing here uh, uh, it's for Arabia it's really like the the, the shape and size uh, of of the orange spot for example but here it's more like uh, the pattern of uh, of, mm -hmm. the, of the orange. Yeah, because I don't see any uh, any difference in them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's yeah. it's basically it's highlighting the difference. So basically, uh, basically here it's more purpley, and this is more orange in mm -hmm. real life. Okay, that's very very cool. And uh, uh, my other question was about those like uh, differences uh, in in the year uh in in the in the like between the years so uh sorry once again uh, how it was like driven it was by the climate during those years so uh, uh it's it, it's a big question if so Arabia or real people assumed a generation times two years okay um but it's a big question so ideally what we will try or my next student will try is to keep them in the lab to see if this is actually true Mm -hmm. But Arabia are, always, are not the easiest species to keep in the lab. Um, so what it looks like is, uh, so this is just distribution data. Uh, and it's not perfect. You can see it's like the size actually in, uh, indicates the sample size. So it ranges from like 200 observation to one. Uh, so that, and there's an obs uh, observation bias there as well. Uh, what it looks like is that one lineage is pri primarily flies in, e in even and the other in odd years. <clears throat> and there's, in that case, asynchronous. But you have populations, you have sites where you find them every year. Mm -hmm. or it's, a, it's more from what, when you talk to hobbyists, it's also often frequency dependent. So, you know, in even years, you would, you would fly, uh, you would see hundreds of individuals, and then in odd years, you see perhaps one or two. So, yes, this is as far as we. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, I don't know anything about Evriale, but uh, th does it behave like this uh, everywhere on its on its uh, range, or in some other regions it might be like abundant every year? That is a good question. So I contacted someone who did a PhD on Evriale in Spain, and she's looking into that. So I don't know. So it's it's it's, a, it's, a, it's a something that I'm curious about. But given that, so this is now like a third lineage, which uh, has an, another phenology apparently, as as as, as this is Arica mm -hmm. one. So there seems to be that there there could be some um, uh, lineage specific uh, phenologies. Okay. And, thank you very much. Did someone? wanted to ask something now. Hi, yeah, I just have one question. Yes, Benita. Um, so looking at your map where you have the two different lineages of um, the Volbachia species in, or the two different lineages in the different um, Arabia species. Denmark. Yeah, that was it. Exactly. So I was wondering if you were, for example, this is like just hypothetically speaking, and I don't really know much about Wolbachia species, but if you were, for example, to have a hybrid zone between the two different Cassioides lineages, would you expect that having these different Wolbachia lineages would prevent um, like hybrid populations from forming between these two different Cassioides lineages? Maybe. <laughs> Okay. I mean, it's 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 a very interesting question because we 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 don't know that because they don't meet as well. And mine, for example, so I I presented the system. So in the sixties, people actually did some crossing experiments, right? And they could cross two dollars with casuitas, but this doesn't seem to be the case at contact zone. Why is this possible? So <clears throat> back in the time, they actually took individuals to indoors individuals from the east from the eastern distribution where they have the same Wolbachia strain as Castoridis. And then it seems to have worked. Okay. So I I don't know yet. Okay. It's also because we don't have that many samples for, uh, for, uh, from uh, from this range. We just got more so, uh, samples from Nivalis, so which with like Hannah's uh, in her additional chapter, we can we compare Nivalis here from the eastern range with the ones uh, from the contact zone. So 
we, we, we just started with the, with the Wolbachia there as well from the whole genome data. But it's it's surely something interesting to look into. I don't see any raised hands, no questions. I think it was a re re really exhaustive. <laughs> uh, not that like exhaustive because it was nice, but uh, you really covered everything uh, really nicely. Otherwise, if you have questions, just send me an email. Yeah, thank you for that offer. Okay, uh, I, uh, seems that really no one here. Okay, so I would really like to thank you for the talk. It was nice, I learned a lot. And I hope to see you some at some point uh, in person when you could uh, come around or we could be visiting your place. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks again for the invitation yeah. and I think everyone is hungry. Yeah, thank, thank you very much and have a great day.